Well, good morning, Stuart Heights. We're so glad that you were with us this morning, and uh, what an incredible day it is, and what a joy and an honor it has been over the last couple weeks to have you guys worshiping with us in our home, and uh, we are really looking forward to getting back with you guys in a couple weeks and seeing your faces and uh, from a distance waving at you and and all that stuff. But this morning, I want to read some scripture to you. Uh, Psalm 19 is to the choir master, and it says this, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. I encourage you to finish that chapter and read it, but I'm going to skip over to verse 14. It says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So let's sing about that this morning. Join us. Let's sing together. You paint the night. You paint the night. You count the stars and you call them by name. The skies proclaim God you reign. And your glory shines. And you teach the sun. When to bring a new day, creation sings, God, you reign, God, you reign, God, you reign, forever and ever, God, you reign. All my life you have been so 
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Sunday morning service here online. Hope you guys have uh, had a good week. Hope you've had a, a good uh, restful weekend. Uh, and we're just so glad that you're with us here uh, this morning to continue to worship. Uh, let's pray uh, as we continue with our service here this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for, again, for this day. Father, we just thank you for uh, the beauty of this world that you have given us to live in. Father, we just thank you for um, the truths of Scripture that we can hold on to during these times. Father, that as we uh, live in this time of uncertainty, uh, as we live with, with questions about whether we should go out, whether we should wear a mask, whether we should, um, all of these different questions that we have. Father, we thank you that, um, that you are not questioned by any of these things. Father, that that you know that you are a creator, you are sovereign, you, um, that none of this has caught you by surprise. Father, we just pray that you will uh, lead us through our time this morning. Father, we pray that you will uh, be with Brother Gary, help him to um, preach your word. Father, just give him the words to say. Father, we pray that this time will be used as an encouragement uh, for each and every one of us. Father, that you will just, through this message this morning, Lord, that you will just uh, continue to remind us that you are there, that none of this has surprised you. Father, we just pray for uh, wisdom and guidance as we move forward as a church. Father, we just pray for um, our leadership, Lord, that you will lead them through this time, that you will um, just help them to think of all the things they need to think of and all the possibilities. Father, we just pray that you will lead them through this time. Father, we look forward to uh, meeting together as a church again. Father, while we're online, while we're while we still get the um, while we're still able to study the Bible together through Sunday school and and worship online, uh, Father, well, there's a lot of us that miss that uh, connection with other believers, with other members of the body. So, Father, just pray that you will lead us through these coming weeks and months. Lord, help us to be wise, but help us to follow you as well. Lord, help us to be wise, but help us not to be uh, scared at the same time. Lord, just help us. Uh, pray that this time will unify us as a church, that we will uh, show grace to one another, that we will um, just love one another like you have commanded us to do so many times. You, the Bible says that, you will, uh, that people will know that we are your disciples if we love one another. So, Father, during these times, help us to love others just the way that you have loved us. Father, we thank you for displaying that love to us. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, lead us and guide us. Pray, Lord, that your will will be done here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship from my home to your home. Uh, we're looking forward here in a few weeks of regathering on June the 7th. And we understand not everybody's going to be coming back right away, but uh, we want you to know we're going to be streaming the services and we want you to continue to join us. Today, I'd like you to uh, be able to get your Bibles ready from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Get an extra piece of paper. I got some bonus notes I want to be able to give you as we get into the sermon today. It's part two of history of the future. And uh, so I want you to go ahead and do that. Also, don't forget, take a picture, uh, send it to hashtag SHBC Home Worship. And one more thing before we have our just a few moments break, I want you to reach over and hit the share button so that your friends and family who may not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior may make a decision to come to Christ today. So let me give you a moment just to go ahead and do those things. Today, we're going to do, look at part two of history of the future. 
And we saw last week that really that word history is a play on the words. Jesus is giving us the future and it's his story of the future. And really the whole Bible is about his story. And what I like to do is uh, before we get the first Thessalonians and talk about that secret, let's talk about what Jesus said last week. He talks about uh, to his disciples. He makes a statement in, in Matthew 24, 3. Listen to what it says. It says, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And that's when Jesus begins talking to his disciples. They're looking for the kingdom of God. When's this going to happen? Like, when is the second coming going to happen? So Jesus lays out some signs that point them to that. And he talks about uh, uh, false Christ. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. He talks about famine. And we saw last week, he talks about pestilence. And he says that these are the beginning of sorrow. And we saw last week that word, when he says the beginning of sorrows, it talks about labor pains. It talks about uh, uh, the birth pains of a mother giving birth to her child. You know that if you've ever been around and, and, and uh, been a part of seeing a baby being born, that there's intense labor pains. And they, the closer they get together and the harder they get, it, no, it lets us know that the baby's almost here. The baby's almost here. Jesus does the same thing, and he talks about these signs that will happen right here. Basically, he's leading us over into Revelation 6 that we saw last week, the four horses of the apocalypse. We see the white horse rider, okay? That's your false Christ. He looks like Christ. He, he is a Christ, but he's not Jesus. He's the antichrist. Then we see the second horse, the red horse that brings wars and rumors of wars. Then we see the third horse, the black horse rider that brings the famine that happens throughout the world. And we see famine going on in our world today. And then, and then we see the pale horse rider that brings the pestilence, the virus that t captures an entire world and it's doing that today. I think we're living in light of the second coming of Christ, but I don't believe that the seal book has been given to him and he's starting to open it. That's going to happen in the future, but it lets us know it's getting very, very close. And at Matthew 24, let me say this, it's his disciples that come to him and talk to him. I want to go back and look at what Daniel has to say about this future event. And I want you to hang with me for about five minutes real quick. And these are the bonus uh, notes that I'm giving today that go with First Thessalonians. We're going to look at why is it a one-week period. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, he makes this statement. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. In here, uh, some of your translations say units, you know, uh, they use a different word. It's a prophetic week, which is a week of years. And basically he says there's going to be a 70, uh, 70 week period that's going to be given and it's weeks of years. And basically you can divide that up into three periods. You're going to have a period of, uh, in here, uh, the very next verse, verse 25, he tells us, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So he breaks it up into two of the three periods. There's a seven week period. All right. And there's a 62 week period. If you put that together, it's 69 and we have one week left. And that's what we're going to talk about. Daniel 9, 25 shows us those two weeks that from the going forth of the command to rebuild and uh, to re restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, he says it's going to be a seven week period and a 62 week period. In Nehemiah chapter two, verse one, that that proclamation was made. It was made by Artaxerxes. It was when Nehemiah wanted to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Artaxerxes let him do that. And they've calculated the date, March the 14th, 445 BC. Now I'm going to be sharing with you from a book. It's called The Prince, The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson, The Coming Prince. Fascinating book. Uh, he worked for Scotland Yard. He was an inspector and he nails it down to the very day in which Jesus is going to come in as the Messiah and present himself to the nation of Israel. But it's The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. But you'll see in this passage right here, he says that it's uh, a seven week period and a 62 week period. And what, what I want to do is take those two Period, it's a seven week, which is 49 years, all right? Seven times seven, 49. And then the 62 week period, which is 434 years. Basically, we're, we're multiplying 62 weeks times seven. So we have a total of 483 years, all right? 483 years. There's going to be a total, really, when you put them all together, 490 years, but 483 years from the going forth to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, all right? Now, what, sir, what, Robert Anderson did was he took these dates right here and he told us we got to quit using our Western culture and imposing it on an Eastern culture. We use a solar calendar. We have 365 
6.25 days in a year. They don't use a solar calendar. They use a lunar calendar. And a lunar calendar is 360 days in a year. They have 12 30-day months. And so when you use a lunar calendar instead of a solar calendar and you lay this out, the 483 years is 173,880 days. It's right there on the screen, 173,880 days. On March the 14th, 445, Artaxerxes told Nehemiah he could go back and rebuild Jerusalem. If you take the 173,880 days and, and, and take it from March the 14th, 445, you come out April 6th, 32 AD. Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's when Jesus rode into town on the back of a donkey and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They were saying, save now, save now. And he was offering himself as that. But you know what John says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. The very people that were crying Hosanna would scream for his blood five days later, crucify him, crucify him. In this passage, Daniel verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 26 says this, and after 62 weeks, and basically it's after the, the seven-week period, which is 49 years, and after the 62-week period, 434, after those two, he says Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. Basically, if you take the 173,880 days and you lay it out there, on April the 6th, he presented himself as Messiah. But seven days later, he would go to a cross and he would die, but not because of what he did, but for a people. He would literally take the place of Barabbas, but he was really taking the sins of the entire world upon him at that time. And when Jesus died on the cross, the prophetic calendar, the, the clock stopped right there. It stopped right there. And uh, there were 69 weeks fulfilled, but there's a future week. And what's fascinating is in this passage, Daniel is told that these 70 weeks of year deal with your people and your holy city. Has nothing to do with the Gentiles. Has nothing to do with us. When Jesus was giving the signs, those have, has nothing to do with us. It's everything about the Jewish people and about the kingdom of God that's going to be set up. Where Jesus will rule and reign from a king from the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's what they're referring to. But he gives the signs for that. Now there's one week left. It's a seven year period. And friends, that period, you're going to be in heaven. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're going to be in heaven. I'm going to share with you a secret in just a moment, but you'll be in heaven. That one week period that he describes is Revelation 6 through 19, better known as the tribulation, the tribulation. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to see what that secret is that's going to spare us from going through the tribulation. I say this, that the tribulation is when God brings his judgment upon the people, the people of this world. I love what Paul says in Romans. He says, there's, therefore, when you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, there's therefore now no condemnation, no judgment of God upon those who know Jesus Christ. And friends, if you know Jesus Christ, he's going to take you out of here before he unleashes his judgment upon this world. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul's going to talk about the history of the future. And he's going to talk about a secret. I want you to listen to this verse. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 51. It's our Bible verse of the day. And it's, uh, I'm going to give you the New Living Translation because I love how it's laid out. It says this, but, but let me tell you a wonderful secret. I love how he lays that out. God has revealed to us. Let me tell you a wonderful secret that God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. This is the secret. And Paul's going to explain it here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In here, he gives the education of this event. He's going to educate us about this event. This event. You know, we need to know about this. They, they were losing hope, and what they needed was hope at that time. And so Paul is going to educate them about this event. He's going to give them the particulars of this event in this passage. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Here's the education. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Let's take a look at that. This is the secret. The secret is the rapture of the church. 
We used to talk about that. We used to preach messages about that, but you seldom hear much about it anymore. Last uh, uh, time we heard about it was in a movie by Tim LaHaye called Left Behind. And I hope you won't be left behind. I hope you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here Paul gives us education about this event. He talks about the particulars. In essence, what he wants us to know is there is a difference between the second coming and the rapture. When he talks about the second coming and the rapture, he wants us to know that these are separate, distinct events. One applies to the nation of Israel. The other applies to the church. And we're going to see that in here. In here, he starts talking about the rapture. You say, where does the word rapture happen? Notice what it says down in uh, verse um, 16. It says, For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There's a resurrection right there. Then we who are alive remain shall be caught up. That's the, that's a Latin word for rapture. It's the word for caught up. We're taken up while there's a resurrection of those that are dead in Christ. There's a rapture of those who are alive. That's what the secret is, that we will not all sleep, but we all be changed will all be transformed. There are two passages that deal with the scriptures of the rapture. Not only do we say, see the second coming of the rapture are separate, but there are scriptures for the rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, he talks about the rapture. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's 1 Corinthians 15. There's another place he talks about the rapture. It's in Revelation chapter 4. After he's talked about the church in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, he talks about church, churches, churches, and you'll see it over and over and over again. In chapter 4, verse 1, he says this, After these things... I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. There's, there's that sound of a trumpet again. Speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one that sat up on the throne. Friends, I believe that's the rapture of the church right there. Why? Because there's no mention of the church again until you get to the end of the book of Revelation. He's talked about the church in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but no mention of the church from that point on. Church is gone. God is no longer working with the church. He's going to be working with the nation of Israel. And we see these two passages, 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation chapter 4. Those are the scriptures that deal with the rapture as well as 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In here, I want you to notice that he makes a distinction between sleep and death, between sleep and death. In verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. You're going to see that term, fallen asleep, several times. Look what he says in verse 14. For, the, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. There it is again, those who sleep in Jesus. Then he says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. What's he talking about, those who are asleep? Well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, your soul is with the Lord, but the body is in the grave it may be cremated and spread throughout the four corners of the earth. But when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for the church. And those who are asleep, those who have died in Christ before, he's going to resurrect those. There's going to be a resurrection and there's going to be a rapture that happens. And he talks about that, the sleep versus death. Um, in here, we haven't died. And he's just going to rapture and take us out of here. So when he talks about sleep, he's talking about those who have died in Christ. Their bodies are in the ground. Their ashes are spread throughout the earth, but God's going to come back and he's going to resurrect it. Now, he's bringing their souls with him. Notice that. Where, where, where are their souls at? They're in heaven with him and he's bringing them back. So that's going to be a rapture. It's going to take place. Um, when the, God talks about people that die, that have a relationship with him, he never talks about that. He talks about those that sleep. Jesus did the same thing when Lazarus died. He said, hey, we need to go see Lazarus so I can wake him up. And the disciples said, wait a minute. We don't want to wake him up. We want him to stay asleep so he can get well sooner. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. They understood that. All right. And in here, it's interesting when he talks about believers, he never talks about them being dead. He talks about them being asleep. He's going to resurrect them. And those who are alive, he's going to rapture them. Now we see the, uh, in here, the particulars, we see the second coming and the rapture are separate. We see that the scriptures of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation chapter 4, <clears throat> we see sleep versus death. Let's talk about the separateness of those that are in Christ. I, I want you to see this. this is a technical term. Look what he says in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead, notice what it says, in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. That statement, in Christ, is a technical term. It, it refers to New Testament saints as compared to Old Testament saints. He's not talking about the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints are not going to be resurrected. They're not going to be raptured at that time. Only New Testament saints. And he's talking about the church when he talks about the New Testament saints. Only those that belong to Jesus in the New Testament, that belong to the church, are in Christ. Now I want to give you a real quick rundown of that, just a couple of sample scriptures. He talks about that all through the New Testament. We start reading Paul's letters and Peter's letters and, and uh, reading in the book of Acts. You're going to see that term in Christ appear over and over. And what the term in Christ means you belong to the church. Revelation or Romans chapter 12, verse 5 says this. So we being many are one body in Christ. He's talking about the church right there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ belongs to Jesus. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. If you belong to Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ, you belong to the church. And he says that there's a distinction between Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. Only the New Testament saints are going to be resurrected, resurrected and raptured. Now, let me say this. The rapture of the church, when it happens, the tribulation is going to happen right after that. While there are no signs for the rapture, by the way, we're going to be surprised by this event. We're surprised by this event. There are no signs for the rapture. There are signs for the second coming of Christ. Now, I say that because I want you to understand that if signs are being fulfilled today for the second coming of Christ, and that doesn't happen until after the rapture, think how much closer the rapture is today of Jesus coming back, of making that call, calling his people home, resurrecting the dead that are in Christ and the rapture of the church taking them. There are no signs for the rapture and there's imminence. This rapture can happen at any moment. There are no signs that need to be fulfilled. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul gives some promises of this event. We see the particulars, but he gives the promise of this event that it's going to happen. It's going to take place. And we're looking forward for the rapture. Look what he says. This is our hope. And this is what we need in our life. In verse 14, he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, the first promise that's given is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power that resurrected Jesus is the same power that's going to resurrect us and rapture us and take us out of here based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not only the resurrection of Jesus Christ, look what he says in verse 15. He says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Not only the resurrection of Christ fulfills this promise right there, uh, but the revelation of Jesus Christ, God's word. God's word said it and that settles it. I don't know if you like bumper sticker theology, but a lot of people do. Um, years ago, there was a, a bumper sticker that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I, I lived up in Detroit. It was kind of interesting when this was very popular. A lot of people had that bumper sticker out there. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And then our pastor one Sunday said, I don't believe that. And everybody was like, oh, I couldn't believe he said that. He says, God said it, and it really doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, that settles it. And based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ, based upon the revelation of God's word, God said it, that settles it. This future event is going to happen. And then I love the very next statement, what he says. Look what he says. In verse 16, for the Lord himself, the representation of Jesus Christ, he doesn't delegate this to the angels. He doesn't delegate it to mankind. He himself is coming back to rapture and resurrect us there at the end. Paul not only gives us the education about this event, how Jesus is coming back to take care of his church, how he's going to resurrect the dead that are in Christ, how he's going to rapture the church and take them to heaven before he unleashes his wrath upon this world here. Where you look at Revelation 6 through 19, you see the judgment of God that's happening there, but the church will be in heaven. So Paul not only educates us, but he wants us to give edification about this event. Listen to the very last statement of chapter 4, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And friends, we can have comfort knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe today is the day of salvation for you. You can be spared from the wrath to come upon this world, friend, and going through the tribulation. You'll be taken out of here in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, it's as easy as ABC to come to Christ. 
A, you have to admit you can't do it on your own. This is something that you can't do. You can't be good enough. You can't earn it. The Bible says it's not of works lest any man should boast. Then what am I supposed to do, Gary? Well, B, believe that Jesus went to the cross and took your place. Jesus died in your place on the cross. He died for the sins of the world. And then C, claim him as your Lord and Savior. If you're willing to do that today, you can be in Christ. You can have that relationship with him. Let's pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you'd say something like this. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was buried and I believe he rose again the third day. And right now, Jesus, the best I know how, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior today. I give you my life to do with it as you please. Now, if you prayed that in earnestness, friend, I want you to know that God means business with you. You're on a brand new journey, and we'd like to help you take those next steps. If you'll go online and just comment right there, if you're on Facebook and say, I prayed or I received Jesus Christ, we'd like to send you some information to help you on this brand new journey that you have in Jesus Christ. You know, we need to take serious our salvation and what we have in Jesus Christ. Quit playing games, quit playing church. Let's get serious and focused about what Christ has done for us. And let's be the church and make a difference in this world. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you so much, friends, for joining us for worship this morning at Stuart Heights Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're here. We pray that you've been encouraged by our time together. I want to remind you, as we've mentioned before, that we'll be regathering for worship at all of our campuses on June the 7th for all four of our Sunday morning worship services at Chattanooga, Hickson, and also at Saudi Daisy. And we're looking forward to those days. We ask you to be praying for those days as we make preparations for social distancing and taking care of all the precautions that we need to so that we can gather for worship on those days at all of our campuses. As we do each week, I want to remind you to be faithful in your giving and through all the normal means that we do so, whether you give online or through texting or whether you send your offerings to our Hickson campus at 1505 Cloverdale. You have been so faithful during this time to be uh, faithful in giving and supporting the ministries of the church, and we're so thankful for that. I want to encourage you to continue, but also to continue to pray for one another through the means that we typically use through our website at stuartheights.org and the prayer request tab, but also in the chat uh, box in our Facebook videos, you can put those there or send us an email at churchoffice at stuartheights.org. We hope that you've had a great time with us. We pray that you have a great Sunday afternoon. Thanks again for worshiping with us. Have a great day.